Hi everybody. Merry Christmas. Can you guys hear me? I mean, Christmas ended a couple of days ago, but we're all still in the spirit, right? How is everybody doing? Hi, Mesera. Hi, Zap Girl. Can you guys hear me? I don't have anybody here to tell me if I can be heard or not. So I'm going to just turn my channel on and you might hear some feedback so I could turn it down. I can be heard or not. Oh, so. I can. Look at that. I can be heard. <laughs> okay. So as it gets dark, you guys, well, because it's 4.05 here right now on the West Coast. You guys will see it in real time get dark. Hello. I did my hair like this. Oh my gosh, look how messed up it is. But I have like my hair pulled. Up. Anyway, I'm over here. So you guys could have nice ambiance. Okay, good. So we're going to finish this book today. What do you guys say? We're on chapter 22. It will probably take about maybe two and a half hours and we'll go from there. I got a really big surprise um, gift today from Zav. So thank you so much, Zav. Um, she got me a Nespresso maker with all these flavors of Nespresso. And I'm um, spazzing out a little, but I'm going to try to... I'm going to try to keep my demeanor. <laughs> so if I sound a little different, just know why. You guys know me so well anyways. Okay. Hi, Steph. Do you see the cute fireplace? Steph got me to get that. Okay. Are we ready, guys? All right. Let's get comfy. Got to get really close to the mic. Yeah, it's raining here, but like kind of not, I don't know. Hold on, I'm going to put you guys on mute so you don't hear the ugliness of opening the door, but I'm going to open the door. It might make me freezing, but hold on a second. Am I back? Yes. Hi, Megan Randall. Thanks for joining us. Okay, guys. So the rain's outside. It's cozy. And let's start this. Okay. We're on chapter 22. All night long, your thoughts are on the air. Am I sleeping? Have I slept at all? This is insomnia. Try to relax a little more with every breath out. But your heart's still racing and your thoughts tornado in your head. Nothing works. Not guided meditation. You're in Ireland. Not counting sheep. You count up the days, hours, minutes, 
since you can remember falling asleep. Your doctor laughed. Nobody ever died from lack of sleep. The old bruised fruit way your face looks, you think you were dead. After three o'clock in the morning in a hotel bed in Seattle, it's too late for you to find a cancer support group. Too late to find some little blue Anatol sodium capsules or lipstick red second dolls. The whole valley of the dolls play set. After three in the morning, you can't get into a fight club. You've got to find Tyler. You've got to get some sleep. Then you're awake and Tyler's standing in the dark next to the bed. You wake up. The moment you were falling asleep, Tyler was standing there saying, wake up, wake up. We solved the problem with the police here in Seattle. Wake up. The police commissioner wanted to crack down on what he called a gang type activity in after hours boxing clubs. But not to worry, Tyler said, Mr. Police Commissioner shouldn't be a problem. Tyler says, we have him by the balls now. I asked if Tyler's been following me. Funny, Tyler says, I wanted to ask you the same thing. You talked about me to other people, you little shit. You broke your promise. Tyler was wondering when I'd figure him out. Every time you fall asleep, Tyler says, I run off and do something wild, something crazy, something completely out of my mind. Tyler kneels down next to the bed and whispers, last Thursday, you fell asleep. I took a picture. I took a plane to Seattle for a little fight club look see to check the trimway numbers, that sort of thing. Look for a new talent. We have Project Mayhem in Seattle too. Tyler's fingertip traces the swelling along my eyebrows. We have Project Mayhem in Los Angeles and Detroit. A big Project Mayhem going down in Washington DC in New York. We have Project Mayhem in Chicago like you would not believe. Tyler says, I can't believe you broke your promise. The first rule is you don't talk about Fight Club. He was in Seattle last week when a bartender in a neck brace told him that the police were going to crack down on Fight Clubs. The police commissioner himself wanted it special. What it is, Tyler says, is we have police who come to fight at Fight Club and really like it. We have newspaper reporters and law clerks and lawyers, and we know everything before it's going to happen. We were going to be shut down. At least in Seattle, Tyler says. I ask, what did Tyler do about it? What did we do about it, Tyler says. We called an assault committee meeting. There isn't a me and you anymore, Tyler says, and he pinches the end of my nose. I think you figured that out. We both use the same body, but at different times. We called a special homework assignment, Tyler says. We said, bring me the steaming testicles of his esteemed honor, Seattle Police Commissioner or whoever. I'm not dreaming. Yes, Tyler says, you are. We put together a team of 14 space monkeys and five, the, five of these space monkeys were police. And we were every person in the park where his honor walked his dog tonight. Don't worry, Tyler says, the dog is all right. The whole attack took three minutes less than an app, our best run through. We protected 12 minutes. We projected 12 minutes. Our best run through was nine minutes. 
We have five space monkeys holding down. Tyler's telling me this, but somehow I already know it. Three space monkeys were on lookout. One space monkey did the ether. One space monkey tugged down his esteemed sweatpants. The dog is a spaniel and it's just barking and barking, barking and barking, barking and barking. One space monkey wrapped the rubber band three times until it was tight around the top of his esteemed sack. One monkey's between his legs with the knife. Tyler whispers with his punched out face by my ear. And I'm whispering in his most esteemed police commissioner's ear that he better stop the Fight Club crackdown or will tell the world that his esteemed honor does not have any balls. Tyler whispers, how far do you think you'll get your honor? The rubber band is cutting off any feeling down there. How far do you think you'll get in politics if the voters know you have no nuts? By now, his honor has lost all feeling. Man, his nuts are ice cold. Even if one fight club has to close, we'll send his nuts east and west. One goes to the New York Times and one goes to the Los Angeles Times. One to each, sort of a press release style. The space monkey took their ether rag off his mouth and the commissioner said, don't. And Tyler said, we have nothing to lose except fight club. The commissioner, he had everything. All we were left was the shit and the trash of the world. Tyler nodded to the space monkey with the knife between the commissioner's legs. Tyler asked, imagine the rest of your life with your bag flapping empty. The commissioner said, no, and don't stop, please. Oh, God, help me, help, no, me, God, me, stop that. And the space monkey slips the knife in and only cuts off the rubber band. Six minutes total and we were done. Remember this, Tyler said, the people you're trying to step on were everyone you depend on. We're the people who do your laundry and cook your food and serve your dinner. We make your bed. We guard you while you're asleep. We drive the ambulances. We direct your call. We are cooks and taxi drivers and we know everything about you. We process your insurance claims and credit card charges. We control every part of your life. We are the middle children of history, raised by television to believe that someday we'll be millionaires and movie stars and rock stars, but we won't. And we're just learning this fact, Tyler said. So don't fuck with us. The space monkey had to press the ether down hard on the commissioner's sobbing and put him all the way out. Another team dressed him and took him and his dog home. After that, the secret was up to him to keep. And no, we didn't expect any more Fight Club crackdown. His esteemed honor went home, scared but intact. Every time we do these little homework assignments, Tyler says, these Fight Club men with nothing to lose are a little more invested in Project Mayhem. Tyler kneeling next to my bed says, close your eyes and give me your hand. I close my eyes and Tyler takes my hand. I feel Tyler's lips against the scar of his kiss. I said that if you talked about me behind my back, you'd never see me again, Tyler said. We're not two separate men. Long story short, when you're awake, you have the control and you can call yourself anything you want. But the second you fall asleep, I take over 
and you become Tyler Durden. But we fought, I say, the night we invented Fight Club. You weren't really fighting me, Tyler says. You said so yourself. You were fighting everything you hate in your life. But I can see you. You're asleep. But you're renting a house. You held a job, two jobs. Tyler says, order your canceled checks from the bank. I rented the house in your name. I think you'll find the handwriting on the rent check matches the notes you've been typing for me. Tyler's been spending my money. It's no wonder I'm always overdrawn. And the jobs? Well, why do you think you're so tired? Jeez, it's not insomnia. As soon as you fall asleep, I take over and go to work or fight club or wherever. You're lucky I didn't get a job as a snake handler. I say, but what about Marla? Marla loves you. Marla loves you. Marla doesn't know the difference between you and me. You gave her a fake name the night you met. You never gave her your real name at the support group. You inauthentic shit. Since I saved her life, Marla thinks your name is Tyler Durden. So now that I know about Tyler, will he just disappear? No, Tyler says, still holding my hand. I wouldn't be here in the first place if you didn't want me. I'll still, I'll still live my life while you're asleep. But if you fuck with me, if you chain yourself to the bed at night or take big doses of sleeping pills, then we'll be enemies and I'll get you for it. Oh, this is bullshit. This is a dream. Tyler is a projection. He's a disassociative personality disorder, a psychogenetic fatigue state. Tyler Durden is my hallucination. Fuck that shit, Tyler says. Maybe you're my schizophrenic hallucination. I was here first, Tyler says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's just see who's here last. This isn't real. This is a dream. And I'll wake up. Then wake up. And then the telephone's ringing and Tyler's gone. Sun is coming through the curtains. It's my 7 a.m. wake up call. And when I pick up the receiver, the line is dead. Chapter 23. Fast forward. I fly back home to Marla and the Paper Street Soap Company. Everything is still falling apart. At home, I'm too scared to look in the fridge. Picture dozens of little plastic sandwich bags labeled with cities like Las Vegas and Chicago and Milwaukee, where Tyler had to make good his threats to protect chapters of Fight Club. Inside each bag would be a pair of messy tidbits, frozen solid. In one corner of the kitchen, a space monkey squats on a cracked linoleum and studies himself in a hand mirror. I am the all-singing, all-dancing crap of this world, the space monkey tells the mirror. I am the toxic waste of byproduct of God's creation. Another space monkey moves around in the garden, picking things, killing things. With one hand on the freezer door, I take a big breath and try to center my enlightened spiritual entity. <sighs> Raindrops on roses, happy Disney animals. This makes my heart purr. The freezers open an inch when Marla peers over my shoulder and says, what's for dinner? The space monkey looks himself squatting in the hand mirror. I am the shit and infectious human waste of creation. Full cycle. 
About a month ago, I was afraid to let Marla look in the fridge. Now I'm afraid to look in the fridge myself. Oh God, Tyler, Marla loves me. Marla doesn't know the difference. I'm glad you're back, Marla says. We have to talk. Oh yeah, I say, we have to talk. I can't bring myself to open the freezer. I'm Joe's shrinking groin. I tell Marla, don't touch anything in this freezer. Don't even open it. If you ever find anything inside it, don't eat them or feed them to a cat or anything. The space monkey with the hand mirror is eyeing us. So I tell Marla we have to leave. We need to be someplace else to have this talk. Down the basement stairs, one space monkey is reading to the other space monkeys. Three ways to make napalm. One, you can mix equal parts of gasoline and frozen orange juice concentrate, the space monkeys in the basement. Two, you can mix equal parts of gasoline and diet cola. Three, you can dissolve crumbled cat litter and gasoline until the mixture is thick. Marla and I, we mass transit from the Paper Street Soap Company to a window booth at the Planet Denny's, the Orange Planet. This was something Tyler talked about, how since England did all the exploration and built colonies and made maps, most of the places in geography have these secondhand sort of English names. The English got to name everything, or almost everything, like Ireland, New London, Australia, New London, India, New London, Idaho, New York, New York. Fast forward to the future. This way, when deep space exploration ramps up, it will probably be a megatonic corporation that discover all the new planets and map them. The IBM Stellar Sphere, the Philip Morris Galaxy, Planet Denny's. Every planet will take on a corporate identity of whoever rapes it first. Budweiser World. Our waiter has a big goose egg on his forehead and stands ramrod straight heels together. Sir, our waiter says, would you like to order now, sir? He says, anything you order is free of charge, sir. You can imagine you smell urine in everybody's soup. Two coffees, please. Marla asks, why is he giving us free food? The waiter thinks I'm Tyler Durden, I say. In that case, Marla orders fried clams and clam chowder and a fish basket and fried chicken and a baked potato with everything and a chocolate chiffon pie. Through the pass-through window into the kitchen, three line cooks, one with stitches along his upper lip, are watching Marla and me and whispering with their three bruised heads together. I tell the waiter, give us clean food, please. Please, don't be doing any trash to the stuff we order. In that case, sir, our waiter says, may I advise against the lady here eating the clam chowder? Thank you, no clam chowder. Marla looks at me and I tell her, trust me. The waiter turns on his heel and marches our order back to the kitchen. Through the kitchen, pass through window, the three line cooks give me the thumbs up. Marla says, you get some nice perks being Tyler Durden. From now on, I tell Marla, she has to follow me everywhere at night and write down everywhere I go. Who do I see? Do I castrate anyone important? That sort of detail. I take out my wallet and show Marla my driver's license with my real name, not Tyler Durden. But everyone knows you're Tyler Durden, Marla says. Everyone but me. Nobody at work calls me Tyler Durden. My boss calls me by my real name. My parents know who I really am. So why, Marla asks, 
are you Tyler Durden to some people, but not to everybody? The first time I met Tyler, I was asleep. I was tired and crazy and rushed. And every time I boarded a plane, I wanted the plane to crash. I envied people dying of cancer. I hated my life. I was tired and bored with my job and my furniture, and I couldn't see any way to change things. Only end them. I felt trapped. I was too complete. I was too perfect. I wanted a way out of my tiny life, single serving butter and cramped airline seat role in the world, Swedish furniture, clever art. I took a vacation. I fell asleep on the beach. And when I woke up, there was Tyler Durden, naked and sweating, gritty with sand, his hair wet and stringy, hanging in his face. Tyler was pulling driftwood logs out of the surf and dragging them up the beach. What Tyler had created was the shadow of a giant hand. And Tyler was sitting in the palm of a perfection he'd made himself. And a moment was the most you could ever expect from perfection. Maybe I never really woke up on that beach. Maybe all this started when I peed on the bar in the stone. When I fell asleep, I don't really sleep. At other tables in the planet Denny's, I count one, two, three, four, five guys with black cheekbones or folded down noses smiling at me. No, Marla says, you don't sleep. Tyler Durden is a separate personality I've created and now he's threatening to take over my real life. Just like Tony Perkins' mother in Psycho, Marla says, this is so cool. Everybody has their little quirks. One time, I dated a guy who couldn't get enough body piercings. My point being, I say, I fall asleep and Tyler is running off with my body and punched out face to commit some crime. The next morning, I wake up, bone tired and beat up, and I'm sure I haven't slept at all. The next night, I'd go to bed earlier. The next night, Tyler would be in charge a little longer. Every night that I go to bed earlier and earlier, Tyler will be in charge longer and longer. But you are Tyler, Marla says. No, no, I'm not. I love everything about Tyler Durden, his courage and his smarts, his nerve. Tyler is funny and charming and forceful and independent and men look up to him and expect him to change their world. Tyler is capable and free, and I am not. I'm not Tyler Durden. But you are Tyler, Marla says. Tyler and I share the same body, and until now, I didn't know it. Whenever Tyler was having sex with Marla, I was asleep. Tyler was walking and talking while I thought I was sleeping. Everyone in Fight Club and Project Mayhem know me as Tyler Durden. And I went to bed earlier every night and slept later every morning eventually. I'd be gone altogether. I'd just go to sleep and never wake up. Marla says, just like the animals at the animal control place. Valley of the Dogs. Or even if they don't kill you, if someone loves you enough to take you home, they still castrate you. I would never wake up and Tyler would take over. The waiter brings the coffee and clicks his heels and leaves. I smell my coffee. It smells like coffee. So, Marla says, even if I did believe all this, what do you want from me? So Tyler can't take complete control. I need Marla to keep me awake all the time. Full circle. 
The night Tyler saved her life, Marla asked him to keep her awake all night. The second I fall asleep, Tyler takes over and something terrible will happen. And if I do fall asleep, Marla has to keep track of Tyler. Where he goes, what he does. So maybe during the day I can rush around and undo the damage. Chapter 24. His name is Robert Paulson, and he is 48 years old. His name is Robert Paulson, and Robert Paulson will be 48 years old forever. On a long enough timeline, everyone's survival rate drops to zero. Big Bob, the big cheese bread, the big moosey on a regulation chill and drill homework assignment. This was how Tyler got into my condominium to blow it up with homemade dynamite. You take a spray canister of refrigerant, R12, if you can still get it. What with the ozone hole and everything, or R13, R134A, and you spray it into the lock cylinder until the works are frozen. On a chill and drill assignment, you spray the lock on the pay telephone or a parking meter or a newspaper box. Then you use the hammer and a cold chisel to shatter the frozen lock cylinder. On a regulation drill and fill homework assignment, you drill the phone or the automatic bank teller machine. Then you screw a lube fitting into the hole and use a grease gun to pump your target full of axle grease or vanilla pudding or plastic cement. It's not that Project Mayhem needed to steal a handful of change. The Paper Street Soap Company was backlogged on filling orders. God help us when the holidays came around. Homework is to build your nerve. You need some cunning. Build your investment in Project Mayhem. Instead of a cold chisel, you can use an electric drill on the frozen lock cylinder. This works just as well, and it's more quiet. It was a cordless electric drill that the police thought was a gun when they blew Big Bob away. There was nothing to tie Big Bob to Project Mayhem or Fight Club or the soap. In his pocket was a wallet photo of himself, huge and naked at first glance in a posing strap at some contest. It's a stupid way to live, Bob said. You're blind from the straight stage lights and deaf from the feedback rush of the sound system until the judge will order, extend your right quad flex and hold. Put your hands where we can see them. Extend your left arm, flex the bicep and hold. Freeze, drop the weapon. This was better than real life. On his hands was a scar from my kiss, from Tyler's kiss. Big Bob's sculpted hair had been shaved off and his fingerprints had been burned off with lye. And it was better to get hurt than get arrested because if you were arrested, you were off Project Man. No more homework assignments. One minute, Robert Paulson was the warm center that the life of the world crowded around. And the next moment, Robert Paulson was an object. After the police shot, the amazing miracle of death. In every fight club tonight, the chapter leader walks around in the darkness outside of the crowd of men who stare at each other across the empty center of every fight club basement. And this voice yells, his name is Robert Paulson. And the crowd yells, his name is Robert Paulson. The leaders yell, he is 48 years old. 
and the crowd yells. He is 48 years old. He is 48 years old and he was part of Fight Club. He is 48 years old and he was part of Project Mayhem. Only in death will we have our own names since only in death are we no longer part of the effort. In death, we become heroes. And the crowd yells, Robert Paulson. And the crowd yells, Robert Paulson. And the crowd yells, Robert Paulson. I go to Fight Club tonight to shut it down. I stand in one light, the center of the room, and the club cheers. To everyone here, I'm Tyler Durden, smart, forceful, gutsy. I hold up my hands for silence, and I suggest, why don't we all just call it a night? Go home tonight and forget about Fight Club. I think Fight Club has served its purpose, don't you? Project Mayhem is canceled. I hear there's a good football game on television. 100 men just stare at me. A man is dead, I say. The game is over. It's not for fun anymore. Then from the darkness outside the crowd comes the anonymous voice of the chapter leader. The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. I yell, go home. The second rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. Fight Club is canceled. Project Mayhem is canceled. The third rule is only two guys to a fight. I am Tyler Durden, and I yell, and I'm ordering you to get out. And no one's looking at me. The men just stare at each other across the center of the room. The voice of the chapter leader goes slowly around the room. Two men do a fight, no shirts, no shoes. The fight goes on and on and on as long as it has to. Picture this happening in a hundred cities in a half dozen languages. The rules end and I'm still standing in the center of the light. Registered fight number one, take the floor, yells the voice out of the darkness. Clear the center of the club. I don't move. Clear the center of the club. I don't move. The one light reflects out of the darkness in 100 pairs of eyes. All of them focusing on me, waiting. I try to see each man the way Tyler would see him. Choose the best fighters for training in Project Mayhem. Which ones would Tyler invite to work at the Paper Street Soap Company? Clear the center of the club. This is the established fight club procedure. After three requests from the chapter leader, I will be ejected from the club. But I'm Tyler Durden. I invented fight club. Fight club is mine. I wrote those rules. None of you would be here if it wasn't for me. And I say, it stops here. Prepare to evict the member in three, two, one. The circle of men collapses in on top of me and 200 hands clamp around every inch of my arms and legs and I'm lifted spread eagle toward the light. Prepare to evacuate soul in five, in four, three, two, one. And I'm passing overhead, overhead, hand to hand, crowd surfing toward the door. I'm floating. I'm flying. I'm yelling. Fight Club is mine. Project Mayhem was my idea. You can't throw me out. I'm in control here. Go home. The voice of the chapter leader yells. Registered fight number one. Please take the center of the floor. Now. I'm not leaving. I'm not giving up. I can beat this. I'm in control here. Evict Fight Club member now. Evacuate soul now. 
and I fly slowly out the door and into the night with the stars overhead and the cold air and I settle to the parking lot concrete. All the hands retreat and a door shuts behind me and a bolt snaps it locked. In a hundred cities, Fight Club goes on without me. Chapter 25. For years now, I've wanted to fall asleep. The sort of slipping off, the giving up, the falling part of sleep. Now sleeping is the last thing I want to do. I'm with Marla in room 8G at the Regent Hotel with all the old people and junkies shut up in their little rooms. Here, somehow, my pacing desperation seems sort of normal and expected. Here, Marla says, while she's sitting cross-legged on her bed and, pinch and punching a half a dozen wake-up pills out of their plastic blister card. I used to date a guy who had terrible nightmares. He hated to sleep too. What happened to the guy she was dating? Oh, he died. A heart attack. Overdose. Way too many amphetamines, Marla says. He was only 19. Thanks for sharing. When we walked into the hotel, the guy at the lobby desk and half his hair torn out of the roots, his scalp looked raw and scrubbed. He saluted me. The seniors watching television in the lobby all turned to see who I was when the guy at the desk called me sir. Good evening, sir. Right now, I can imagine him calling some Project Mayhem headquarters and reporting my whereabouts. They'll have a wall map of the city and trace my movements with little push pins. I feel tagged like a migrating goose on Wild Kingdom. They're all spying on me, keeping tabs. You can take all six of these and not get sick to your stomach, Marla says. But you have to take them by putting them up your butt. Oh, this is pleasant. Marla says, I'm not making this up. We can get something stronger later. Some real drugs like crosstops or black beauties or alligators. I'm not putting those pills up my ass. Then only take two. Where are we going? Bowling. It's open all night and they won't let you sleep there. Everywhere we go, I say, guys on the street think I'm Tyler Durden. Is that why the bus driver let us ride for free? Yeah, and that's why the two guys on the bus gave us their seats. So what's your point? I don't think it's enough to just hide out. We have to do something to get rid of Tyler. I dated a guy once who liked to wear my clothes, Marla says. You know, dresses, hats with veils. We could dress you up and sneak you around. I'm not cross-dressing and I'm not putting pills up my ass. It gets worse, Marla says. I dated a guy once who wanted me to fake a lesbian scene with his blow-up doll. I could imagine myself becoming one of Marla's story stories. I dated a guy once who was a split personality. I dated this other guy who used one of those penis enlargement systems. I asked, what time is it? 4 a.m. In another three hours, I have to be at work. Take your pills, Marla says. You being Tyler Durden and all, they'll probably just let us bowl for free. Hey, before we get rid of Tyler, can we go shopping? We could get a nice car, some clothes, some CDs. There's an upside to all of this free stuff. Marla, okay, forget it. Chapter 26. That old saying about how you always kill the thing you love. Well, it works both ways. 
and it does work both ways. This morning I went to work and there were police barricades between the buildings and the parking lot with the police at the front doors taking statements from the people I work with. Everybody milling around. I didn't even get off the bus. I'm Joe's cold sweat. From the bus, I can see the floor to ceiling windows on the third floor of my office building are blown out. And inside a fireman in a dirty yellow slicker is whacking at the burnt panel in the suspended ceiling. A smoldering desk inches out the broken window, pushed by two firemen. Then the desk tilts and slides and falls the quick three stories to the sidewalk and lands with more of a feeling than a sound. Brakes opened and it's still smoking. I'm the pit of Joe's stomach. It's my desk. I know my boss is dead. The three ways to make napalm. I knew Tyler was going to kill my boss. The second I smelled gasoline on my hands, when I said I wanted out of my job, I was giving him permission, be my guest, kill my boss. Oh, Tyler. I know a computer blew up. I know this because Tyler knows this. I don't want to know this, but he used a jeweler's drill to drill a hole through the top of the computer monitor. All the space monkeys know this. I typed up Tyler's notes. This is a new version of the light bulb combo, the light bulb bomb, where you drill a hole in a light bulb and fill the bulb with gasoline, plug the hole with wax or silicone, then screw the bulb into a socket and let someone walk into the room and throw the switch. A computer tube can hold a lot more gasoline than a light bulb. A CRT, you either remove the plastic housing around the tube, this is easy enough, or you work through the vent panels in the top of the housing. First, you have to unplug the monitor from the power source and from the computer. This would also work with a television. Just understand if there's a spark, even staticky electricity from the carpet, you're dead. Screaming burned alive, dead. A CRT can hold 300 volts of passive electrical storage. So use a hefty screwdriver across the main power supply cap capacitor first. If you're dead at this point, you didn't use an insulated screwdriver. There's a vacuum inside the cathode ray tube. So the moment you drill through, the tube will suck air, sort of inhale a little whistle of it. Ream the little hole with a larger bit, then a larger bit, until you can put the tip of a funnel into the hole. Then fill the tube with your choice of explosive. Homemade napalm is good. Gasoline or gasoline mixed with frozen orange juice concentrate or cat litter. A sort of fun explosive is potassium permanganate mixed with powdered sugar. The idea is to mix one ingredient that will burn very fast with a second ingredient that will supply enough oxygen for that burning. This burns so fast, it's an explosive barium peroxide or zinc dust, ammonium nitrate and powdered aluminum, the new Val cuisine of anarchy. Barium nitrate is a sauce of sulfur and garnished with charcoal. That's your basic gunpowder, powder. Bon appetit. Pack the computer monitor full of this and when someone turns on the power, this is five or six pounds of gunpowder exploding in their face. The problem is, I sort of liked my boss. If you're male and you're Christian and living in America, your father is your model for God. And sometimes you find your father in your career. Except Tyler didn't like my boss. The police would be looking for me. 
I was the last person out of the building last Friday night. I woke up at my desk with my breath condensed with the desktop and Tyler on the telephone telling me, go outside, we have a car, we have a Cadillac. The gasoline was still on my hands. The fight club mechanic asked, what will you wish you'd done before you died? I wanted out of my job. I was giving Tyler permission, be my guest, kill my boss. From my exploded office, I ride the bus to the gravel turnaround point at the end of the line. This is where the subdivisions peter out to vacant lots and plowed fields. The driver takes out a sack lunch and a thermos and watches me in his overhead mirror. I'm trying to figure out where I can go that the cops won't be looking for me. From the back of the bus, I can see maybe 20 people sitting between me and the driver. I count the backs of 20 heads, 20 shaved heads. The driver twists around in his seat and calls to me in the back seat. Mr. Durden, sir, I really admire what you're doing. I've never seen him before. You have to forgive me for this, the driver says. The committee says that this is your own idea, sir. The shaved heads turn around one after another. Then one by one they stand. One's got a rag in his hand, and you can smell the ether. The closest one has a hunting knife. The one with the knife is the fight club mechanic. You're a brave man, the bus driver says, to make yourself a homework assignment. The mechanic tells the bus driver, shut up and look out doesn't say shit. You know, one of the space monkeys has a rubber band to wrap around your nuts. They fill up the front of the bus. The mechanic says, you know the drill, Mr. Durden. You said it yourself. You said, if anyone ever tries to shut down the club, even you, then we have to get them by the nuts. Gonads, jewels, testes, huevos. Picture the best part of yourself frozen in a sandwich bag at the Paper Street Soap Company. You know it's useless to fight us, the mechanic says. The bus driver chews a sandwich and watches us in the overhead mirror. A police siren wails, coming closer. A tractor rattles across a field in the distance. Birds. A window in the back of the bus is half open. Clouds. Weeds grow at the edge of the gravel turnaround. Bees or flies buzz around the weeds. We're just after a little collateral, the fight club mechanic says. This isn't just a threat this time, Mr. Durden. This time we have to cut them. The bus driver says, it's cops. The siren arrives somewhere at the front of the bus. So what do I have to fight back with? A police car pulls up to the bus, lights flashing blue and red through the bus windshield, and someone outside the bus is shouting, hold up in there. And I'm saved. Sort of. I can tell the cops about Tyler. I can tell them everything about Fight Club and maybe I'll go to jail and then Project Mayhem will be their problem to solve and I won't be staring down a knife. The cops come up the bus steps, the first cop saying, you cut him yet? The second cop says, do it quick. There's a warrant out for his arrest. Then he takes off his hat and to me he says, Nothing personal, Mr. Durden. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. I say, you're all making a big mistake. The mechanic says, you told us you'd probably say that. I'm not Tyler Durden. You told us you'd say that too. I'm changing the rules. 
you can still have Fight Club, but we're not going to castrate anyone. Anyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The mechanic says he's halfway down the aisle holding the knife out in front of him. You said you would definitely say that. Okay, so I'm Tyler Durden. I am. I'm Tyler Durden, and I dictate the rules, and I say, put the knife down. The mechanic calls back over his shoulder. What's our best time to date for cut and run? Somebody yells, four minutes. The mechanic yells, is somebody timing this? Both cops have climbed up into the front of the bus now, and one looks at his watch and says, just a sec. Wait for the second hand to get up to the 12. The cop says, nine, eight, seven. I dive for the open window. My stomach hits the thin metal windowsill, and behind me, the fight club mechanic yells, Mr. Durden, you're going to fuck up the time. Hanging half out the window, I claw at the black rubber sidewall near the tire. I grab the wheel well trim and pull. Someone grabs my feet and pulls. I'm yelling at the little tractor in the distance. Hey, and hey, my face swelling hot and full of blood. I'm hanging upside down. I pull myself out a little. Hands around my ankles pull me back in. My tie flops in my face. My belt buckle catches on the windowsill. The bees and the flies and the weeds are inches from in front of my face, and I'm yelling, hey! Hands are hooked in the back of my pants, tugging me in, hugging my pants and belt down around and over my ass. Somebody inside the bus yells, one minute! My shoe slips off the, my feet. My belt buckle slips inside the windowsill. The hands bring my legs together. The windowsill cuts hot from the sun into my stomach. My white shirt billows and drops down around my head and shoulders. My hands still gripping the wheel well trim. Me still yelling, hey! My legs are stretched out straight and together behind me. My pants slip down my legs and are gone. The sun shines warm on my ass. Blood pounding in my head, my eyes bugging from the pressure. All I can see is the white shirt hanging around my face. The tractor rattles somewhere. The bees buzz somewhere. Everything is a million miles away. Somewhere a million miles behind me, someone is yelling, Two minutes! And a hand slips between my legs and gropes for me. Don't hurt him! Someone says. The hands around my ankles are a million miles away. Picture them at the end of a long, long road guided meditation. Don't picture the windowsill as a dull, hot knife slitting open your belly. Don't picture a team of men tug of war in your legs apart. A million miles away, a bazillion miles away, a rough, warm hand wraps around the base of you and pulls you back, and something is holding you tight, tighter, tighter, a rubber band. You're in Ireland. You're in Fight Club. You're at work. You're anywhere but here. Three minutes. Somebody far, far away yells, you know this speech, Mr. Durden. Don't fuck with Fight Club. The warm hand is cupped under you. The cold tip of the knife. An arm wraps around your chest. Therapeutic physical contact. Hug time. And the ether presses your nose and mouth. Hard. Then nothing. Less than nothing. Oblivion. Chapter 27. The exploded shell of my burned out condo is outer space black 
and devastated in the night above the little lights of the city. With the windows gone, a yellow ribbon of police crime scene tape twists and swings at the edge of the 15-story drop. I wake up on the concrete subfloor. There was maple wood flooring once. There was art on the walls before the explosion. There was Swedish furniture before Tyler. I'm dressed. I put my hand in my pocket and feel. <sighs> I'm whole. Scarred, but intact. Go to the edge of the floor, 15 stories above the parking lot, and look at the city lights and the stars, and you're gone. It's all so beyond us. Up here, in the miles of night between the stars and the earth, I just feel like one of those space animals. Dogs, monkeys, men. You just do your little job. Pull a lever, push a button. You don't really understand any of it. The world is going crazy. My boss is dead. My home is gone. My job is gone. And I'm responsible for it all. There's nothing left. I'm overdrawn at the bank. Step over the edge. The police tape flutters between me and oblivion. Step over the edge. What else is there? Step over the edge. There's Marla. Jump over the edge. There's Marla, and she's in the middle of everything and doesn't know it. And she loves you. She loves Tyler. She doesn't know the difference. Somebody has to tell her, get out. Get out. Save yourself. You ride the elevator down to the lobby and the doorman who never liked you, now he smiles at you with three teeth knocked out of his mouth and says, good evening, Mr. Durden. Can I get you a cab? Are you feeling all right? Do you want to use the phone? You call Marla at the Regent Hotel. The clerk at the Regent says, right away, Mr. Durden. Then Marla comes on the line. The doorman is listening over your shoulder. The clerk at the region is probably listening. You say, Marla, we have to talk. Marla says, you can suck shit. She might be in danger, you say. She deserves to know what's going on. She has to meet you. You have to talk. Where? She should go to the first place we ever met. Remember, think back. The white healing ball of light, the palace of seven doors. Got it, she says. I can be there in 20 minutes. Be there. You hang up and the doorman says, Can I get you a cab, Mr. Durden, free of charge to anywhere you want? The fight club boys are tracking you. No, you say. It's such a nice night. I think I'll walk. It's Saturday night, bowel cancer night in the basement of First Methodist, and Marla is there when you arrive. Marla Singer smoking her cigarette. Marla Singer rolling her eyes. Marla Singer with a black eye. You sit on the shag carpet at the opposite side of the meditation circle and try to summon up your power animal while Marla glares at you with her black eye. You close your eyes and meditate to the palace of the seven doors and you can still feel Marla's glare. You cradle your inner child. Marla glares. Then it's time to hug. Open your eyes. We should all choose a partner. Marla crosses the room in three quick steps and slaps me hard across the face. Share yourself completely. You fucking suck ass piece of shit, Marla says. Around us, everyone stands staring. Then both of Marla's fists are beating me from every direction. 
You killed someone, she's screaming. I called the police and they should be here any minute. I grab her wrists and say, maybe the police will come, but probably they won't. Marla twists and says the police are speeding over here to hook me up to their electric chair and bake my eyes out, or at least give me a lethal injection. This will feel just like a bee sting, an overdose shot of sodium and phenobarbital, and then the big sleep, Valley of Dog style. Marla says she saw me kill somebody today. If she means my boss, I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, the police know. Everyone's looking for me to lethally inject me already. But it was Tyler who killed my boss. Tyler and I just happen to have the same fingerprints, but no one understands. You can suck shit, Marla says, and pushes her punched out black eye at me. Just because you and your little disciples like getting beat up, you touch me ever again and you're dead. I saw you shoot a man tonight, Marla says. No, it was a bomb, I say, and it happened this morning. Tyler drilled a computer monitor and filled it with gasoline or black powder. All the people with real bowel cancers are standing around watching this. No, Marla says, I followed you to the Pressman Hotel and you were a waiter at one of those murder mystery places. The murder mystery party rich people would come to the hotel for big dinner party and act out a sort of Agatha Christie story sometime between the boudoon of Graval and saddle of venison the lights would go out for a minute and someone would fake getting killed it's supposed to be a fun let's pretend sort of death the rest of the meal the guests would get drunk and eat their moderna consuma and try to find clues to who among them was a psychotic killer. Marlo yells, you shot the mayor's special envoy on recycling. Tyler shot the mayor's special envoy on whatever, Marla says, and you don't even have cancer. It happens that fast. Snap your fingers. Everyone's looking. I yell, you don't have cancer either. He's been coming here for two years, Marlo shouts, and he doesn't have anything. I'm trying to save your life. What? Why does my life need saving? Because you've been following me. Because you followed me tonight. Because you saw Tyler Jordan kill someone, and Tyler will kill anybody who threatens Project Mayhem. Everyone in the room looks snapped out of their little tragedies, their little cancer thing. Even the people on pain meds look wide-eyed and alert. I say to the crowd, I'm sorry, I never meant any harm. We should go. We should talk about this outside. Everybody goes, no, stay, what else? I didn't kill anybody, I say. I'm not Tyler Jordan. He's the other side of my split personality, I say. Has anybody here seen the movie Sybil? Marla says, so who's going to kill me? Tyler. You? Tyler, I say, but I can't, but I can take care of Tyler. You just have to watch out for the members of Project Mayhem. Tyler might have given them orders to follow you or kidnap you or something. Why should I believe any of this? It happens that fast. I say, because I think I like you. Marla says, not love? This is a cheesy enough moment, I say. Don't push it. Everybody watching smiles. I have to go. I have to get out of here. I say, Watch out for the guys with shaved heads or guys who look beat up, black eyes, missing teeth, that sort of thing. And Marla says, so where are you going? I have to take care of Tyler Durden. I'm going to shut my door really quick, guys. Give me a second.
sorry about that guys um so the rain had stopped and now it was just like speeding cars and dogs barking and we don't need to hear that so yeah thank you guys okay so here we go we are what an hour and 10 minutes in i think you guys were gonna finish before the two hour mark i didn't think that would happen okay so chapter 28 his name was patrick madden and he was the mayor's special envoy on recycling his name was patrick madden and he was an enemy of project mayhem I walk out into the night around First Methodist and it's all coming back to me. All the things that Tyler knows are coming back to me. Patrick Madden was compiling a list of bars where fight clubs met. All of a sudden, I know how to run a movie projector. I know how to break locks and how Tyler had rented a house on Paper Street, just before he revealed himself to me at the beach. I know why Tyler had occurred. Tyler loved Marla. From the first night I met her, Tyler or some part of me had needed a way to be with Marla. Not that any of this matters, not now, but all of the details are coming back to me as I walk through the night to the closest fight club. There's a fight club in the basement of the armory bar on Saturday nights. You can probably find it on the list Patrick Madden was compiling. Poor, dead Patrick Madden. Tonight, I go to the armory bar and the crowds part zipper style when I walk in. To everybody there, I am Tyler Durden, the great, and powerful father and God. All around me I hear, good evening, sir. Welcome to Fight Club, sir. Thank you for joining us, sir. Me, my monster face just starting to heal, the hole in my face smiling through my cheek, a frown on my real mouth. Because I'm Tyler Durden and you can kiss my ass, I registered a fight club every guy in the club that night. I registered a fight every guy in the club that night. 50 fights, one fight at a time. No shoes, no shirt. The fights go on as long as they have to. And if Tyler loves Marla, I love Marla. And what happens doesn't happen in words. I want to smother all the French beaches I'll never see. Imagine stalking elk through the damp canyon forest around Rockefeller Center. The first fight I get, the guy gets me in a full Nelson and rams my face, rams my cheek, rams the hole in my cheek onto the concrete floor until my teeth inside snap off and plant their jagged roots into my tongue. Now I can remember Patrick Ma Maiden. Madden, dead on the floor, his little figurine of a wife, just a little girl with a shit on. His wife giggled and tried to pour champagne between her dead husband's lips. The wife said, the fake blood was too, too red. Mrs. Patrick Madden put two fingers in the blood pool next to her husband and then put the fingers in her mouth. The teeth planted in my tongue, I taste the blood. Mrs. Patrick Madden tasted the blood. I remember being there on the outskirts of the murder mystery party with the space monkey waiter standing bodyguard around me. Marla in her dress with the wallpaper pa pattern of dark roses watched from the other side of the ballroom. My second fight, the guy puts a knee between my shoulder blades. The guy pulls both my arms together behind my back and slams my chest into the concrete floor, my collar, my collarbone on one side. I hear it snap. 
I would do the Elgin marbles with the sledgehammer and wipe my ass with the Mona Lisa. Mrs. Patrick Madden held her two bloody fingers up, the blood climbing the cracks between her teeth, and the blood ran down her fingers, down her wrist, across a diamond bracelet, and to her elbow where it dripped. Fight number three, I wake up and it's time for fight number three. There are no more names in Fight Club. You aren't a name. You aren't your family. Number three seems to know what I need and holds my head in the dark and the smother. There's a sleeper hold that gives you just enough air to stay awake. Number three holds my head in the crook of his arms the way he'd hold a baby or a football in the crook of his arm and hammers my face with the pounding molar of his clenched fist until my teeth bite through the inside of my cheek. Until the hole in my cheek meets the corner of my mouth, the two run together into a ragged leer that opens from under my nose to under my ear. Number three pounds until his fist is raw. Until I'm crying. How everything you ever love will reject you or die. Everything you ever create will be thrown away. Everything you're proud of will end up as trash. I am Ozymandias, king of kings. One more punch and my teeth click shut on my tongue. Half of my tongue drops to the floor and gets kicked away. The little figurine of Mrs. Patrick Madden, Madden knelt on the floor next to the body of her husband, the rich people. The people they called friends, towering drunk around her and laughing. The wife, she said, Patrick? The pool of blood spreading wider and wider until it touches her skirt. She says, Patrick, that's enough. Stop being dead. The blood climbs the hem of her skirt. Capillary action, thread to thread, climbing her skirt. Around me, the men of Project Mayhem are screaming. Then Mrs. Patrick Molden is screaming. And in the basement of the armory bar, Tyler Durden slips to the floor in a warm jumble. Tyler Durden the Great, who was perfect for one moment and who said that a moment is the most you could ever expect from perfection. And the fight goes on and on because I want to be dead. Because only in death do we have names. Only in death are we no longer part of Project Mayhem. Chapter 29. Tyler standing there, perfectly handsome, and an angel in his everything blonde way. My will to live amazes me. Me, I'm a bloody tissue sample dried on a bare mattress in my room at the Paper Street Soap Company. Everything in my room is gone. My mirror with a picture of my foot from when I had cancer for 10 minutes. Worse than cancer. The mirror is gone. The closet door is open and my six white shirts, black pants, underwear, socks, and shoes are gone. Tyler says, get up. Under and behind and inside everything I took for granted, something horrible has been growing. Everything has fallen apart. The space monkeys are cleared out. Everything is relocated. The liposuction fat, the bunk beds, the money, especially the money. Only the garden is left behind and the rented house. Tyler says, the last thing we have to do in your maitre d'un thing, your big death thing. Not like death as a sad, downer thing. This was going to be death as a cheery, empowering thing. Oh, Tyler, I hurt. Just kill me here. Get up. Kill me already. Kill me, kill me, kill me. It has to be big, Tyler says. Picture this, you on top of the world's tallest building, the whole 
building taken over by Project Mayhem. Smoke rolling out the windows, deaths flying into the crowds on the street. A real opera of a death. That's what you're going to get. I say, no, you've used me enough. If you don't cooperate, we'll go after Marla. I say, lead the way. Now get the fuck out of bed, Tyler said, and get your ass into the fucking car. So Tyler and I are up on top of Parker Morris building with the gun stuck in my mouth. We're down to our last 10 minutes. The Parker Morris building won't be here in 10 minutes. I know this because Tyler knows this. The barrel of the gun pressed against the back of my throat. Tyler says, we won't really die. I tongue the gun barrel into my surviving cheek and say, Tyler, you're thinking of vampires. We're down to our last eight minutes. The gun is just in case the police helicopters get here sooner. To God, this looks like one man alone holding a gun in his own mouth. But it's Tyler holding the gun and it's my life. You take a 98% concentration of fuming nitric acid and add the acid to three times that amount of sulfuric acid. You have nitroglycerin. Seven minutes. Mix the nitro with sawdust and you have a nice plastic explosive. A lot of the space monkeys mix their nitro with cotton and add Epsom salt as a sulfate. This works too. Some monkeys, they use paraffin mixed with nitro. Paraffin has never, ever worked for me. Four minutes. Tyler and me at the edge of the roof, the gun in my mouth. I'm wondering how clean the gun is. Three minutes. Then somebody yells, wait. And it's Marla coming toward us across the roof. Marla's coming toward me, just me because Tyler's gone. Poof, Tyler's my hallucination, not hers. Fast as a magic trick, Tyler's disappeared. And now I'm just one man holding a gun in my mouth. We followed you, Marla yells. All the people from the support group, you don't have to do this. Put the gun down. Behind Marla, all the bowel cancers, the brain parasites, the melanoma people, the tuberculosis people are walking, limping, wheelchairing toward me. They're saying, wait. Their voices come to me on a cold wind saying, stop. And we can help you. Let us help you. Across the sky comes the whoa, whoa, whoa of police helicopters. I yell, go, get out of here. This building is going to explode. Marla yells, we know. This is like a total epiphany moment for me. I'm not killing myself. I yell, I'm killing Tyler. I'm Joe's hard drive. I remember everything. It's not love or anything, Marla shouts. But I think I like you too. One minute. Marla likes Tyler. No, I like you, Marla shouts. I know the difference. And nothing, nothing explodes. The barrel of the gun tucked in my surviving cheek, I say, Tyler, you mixed the nitro with paraffin, didn't you? Paraffin never works. I have to do this. The police helicopters. And I pull the trigger. Chapter 30. In my father's house are many mansions. Of course, when I pulled the trigger, I died. Liar. And Tyler died. With the police helicopters thundering toward us and Marla and all the support group people who couldn't save themselves, with all of them trying to save me, I had to pull the trigger. This was better than real life. And 
Your one perfect moment won't last forever. Everything in heaven is white on white, faker. Everything in heaven is quiet, rubber-soled shoes. I can sleep in heaven. People write to me in heaven and tell me I'm remembered, that I'm their hero, I'll get better. The angels here are the Old Testament kind, legions and lieutenants, a heavenly host who works in shifts, days, swing, graveyard. They bring you your meals on a tray with a paper cup of meds, the valley of the dolls play set. I've met God across this long walnut desk with his diplomas hanging on the wall behind him. And God asks me, why? Why did I cause so much pain? Didn't I realize that each of us is a sacred, unique snowflake of special, unique specialness? Can't I see how we're all manifestations of love? I look at God behind his desk, taking notes on a pad, but God's got this all wrong. We are not special. We are not crap or trash either. We just are. We just are. And what happens just happens. And God says, no, that's not right. Yeah, well, whatever. You can't teach God anything. God asks me what I remember. I remember everything. The bullet out of Tyler's gun, it tore out my other cheek to give me a jagged smile from ear to ear. Yeah, just like an angry Halloween pumpkin, Japanese demon. Marla's still on earth, and she writes to me. Someday, she says, they'll bring me back. And if there were a telephone in heaven, I would call Marla from heaven. And the moment she says, hello, I wouldn't hang up. I'd say, hi, what's happening? Tell me every little thing. But I don't want to go back. Not yet. Just because, because every once in a while, somebody brings me my lunch tray and my meds and he has a black eye or his forehead is swollen with stitches and he says, we miss you, Mr. Durden. Or somebody with a broken nose pushes a mop past me and whispers, everything's going according to plan. Whispers. We're going to break up civilization so we can make something better out of the world. Whispers, we look forward to getting you back. Thank you guys. That's the end of the book. How long did that take? An hour and 28 minutes. That's not so bad, right? We did good. Thank you guys so much for being here. Hi, Alma. Thank you all so much for taking the time out. And I will add this to the Fight Club playlist. And you could play it all the way through. It will be almost eight hours long. And you could hear the entire story that way. I didn't realize that Spectrum was on TV. Nice Spectrum. Thank you so much for like advertisement for Spectrum. <laughs> Hi, Mama Mia. Thank you guys so much for being here. And of course, Sav Girl. And I know Mesra was here. I hope you guys had an amazing holiday and you guys have great plans for New Year's. The rain just stopped. And I will see you guys soon. Thank you so much again. Have a great night. Love you all.